Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you ask the questions and we answer. I am joined by my wonderful co-host, Kristen Williams, Doctor of Physical Therapy, Let's see Senior Teacher Extraordinaire. <laughs> I love it. It gets better and better every week. I know. I got to be creative here. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, all right. So um, this question is from Emmanuel. Question for the podcast, why do we get cramps? What actually happens to the muscle when it cramps and why does it happen? Hmm, wanna start off? Yeah, that's a great question. There are, there are many different reasons for cramps and I certainly get this question a lot. Um, you know, cramps can be, they can be neurological where, which is probably not your case, um, but you know, where people, people will get cramping from, um, injuries to their to their spinal cord, to their nerves, just because there's not a good connection, so there's misfiring. You can get cramps from dehydration, from electrolyte imbalances. Um, everybody thinks of the bananas, you know, potassium, drinking your Gatorade, um, which is certainly, I mean, all of these are real reasons for cramping. You can also get cramping, you know, from fatigue. You know, after, let's say after I've gone for a long run or, uh, I've been filming a lot. Sometimes, you know, the muscles will do little fasciculations. Just there's a little bit of almost hyperactivity um, or I'm dehydrated and I need to drink more. So uh, I think it's definitely case dependent on why we cramp. Um, you know, we will see a lot of times people will cramp more when they are maybe weaker in a muscle, you know, diaphragmatic cramping you see with a lot of endurance athletes where they're just not breathing well so or they're they're overusing that diaphragm there's all sorts of it's hard to give one reason it can be weakness it can be overuse it can be electrolyte imbalance it can be a neurological uh you know brain type of brain or you know central nervous system spinal cord peripheral nervous system issue uh that's a tough one but what what's your kind of because i know you get that question too why am i cramping you know what is your stock answer to that yeah i mean i i agree the stock answer is it depends it's like what you just said there are it is multifactorial and it's like well does it happen every time you're trying to push off that leg and your calf cramps or is it happening when you're lying and still at the middle of the night you're I mean, not in the middle of the night but going to bed um, is it happening after activity? Is it happening because you didn't have activity? Is it happening in the bigger muscles or it happening in smaller muscles? Um, but it's, yes, the interplay of, to your point, like with the diaphragm of the different muscles, the coordination. So I, sometimes I'm just like, Hey, maybe something's coming awake and it's trying to participate, but it's been a little bit of a snoozer. And so it's just, it's like, you know, the kid that's, hasn't been as active, but it's trying to play soccer with all the friends. It's going to, you know, that kid's going to be more out of breath, need more breaks, be red in the face. You know, it's that muscle that has probably not been summoned as much to participate, or that muscle is trying to do stuff for all the surrounding muscles that are not participating. You know, we know that we have these fascial connections that um, connect different muscle groups. So it, it could be in the surrounding muscles. It could be up the chain or down the chain. So I, I ask people just like, hey, investigate what is happening, you know, around the time this cramping is happening, because it that's like the whole that's what we do. We investigate and we look for the clues. And, you know, is it after you did a run and you have like dried salt on your face? That's usually indicative of being dehydrated, you know, and those people are, you know, it's so classic in a marathon. People cramp up. Why do they cramp up? Could be that they're dehydrated because you did, there's only so much you can drink if you're perspiring a lot. Um, and sometimes when you drink water, you're actually making yourself more dehydrated if you don't add some com kind of electrolytes in there. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's it could be supplements, it could, or lack of supplements, it could be just you're trying something new and you're you're triggering a little area that hasn't been used or is the air, the surrounding stuff isn't. So I think it's just more like, hmm, okay, did that happen every once in a while? Like sometimes my toe will all of a sudden cramp. It doesn't happen much, but it's like, why is my toe going like that in that clawed feeling? You're like, oh my gosh. Um, of course that happened when I was pregnant. Well, there's all kinds of reasons, hormones. And I probably was dehydrated a lot when I was pregnant, not realizing how much more fluid I needed to be drinking. Um, so there's, 
you know, it's case by case, but it, it is, it, it's a curious question. And the first thing I say is don't be freaked out by it. Like it's, it's, unless it's a neurological, like, uh, like some kind of insult that's causing that, you know, it's just part of the game of life that we're going to have those things happen. Yeah. And you just listen to it. Like, Hmm, I'm mm -hmm. cramping. Maybe I need to, I need to drink more water. I, maybe I need to go, you know, <laughs> have a couple of potato chips. You need a little more salt. I mean, I, I know marathoners who literally, you know, are doing salt tablets. I mean, not necessarily like, like a, you know, like a full thing of salt, but you know, where they are supplementing in order to not cramp iron man athletes, you know, they have a very regimented practice in order to not cramp because of that electrolyte imbalance. And so if, if you're cramping, your body's telling you something. So try to yeah. maybe do like you said, some investigation and figure out why. Yes. All right, this is from Andrea. She says, I'm getting in better shape to attempt to join your classes, but question first, I have lower back pain, which is impacting hip labrum tear from 10 years ago. The Cairo who is, is very physical therapist based said, so as is very tight, a bit painful to stretch. But what he said also was that the bending over with slightly bent knees is bad for L5. Now I don't want to not bend over forever. So wondering about your thoughts on this. Um, so I think that's a kind of bad thing to tell anybody <laughs> personally, because first of all, it's not accurate. I mean, um, there's a lot of people who will never straighten their knees and bend over and can bend over well. What is more important is how are you doing that in the hip pelvis area? Your knees are just helping to facilitate it. But you know, um, so first of all, no offense to that person. That is not something I would ever say. And, and it's not true. It just isn't true. Um, because there's, I mean, look at all the people who hinge and squat in the gym. Um, they're bending their knees and they're doing, if they do it well, they're not putting pressure on that L4 region. So I, where you will feel pressure in the L4 region is if you're moving in your pelvis instead of moving in your hip joint, because the pelvis, just think of the pelvis as this bowl that kind of teeters over the, the femurs. And so if the pelvis is the first thing to move and then it moves more to help you get your trunk over to lean to the ground, you can um, you know, pull on that lumbo sacral area all the way up to the you know upper lumb the lower lumbar spine um and that's hip mechanics it's really understanding if you posteriorly glide your femur which is probably one reason i don't know enough about you but people that tear their labrum it's often from the mechanics of tilting the pelvis over and over and over again and what that does is if just like the bowl it kind of pinches off some of the space in the front of that hip. We figure out different ways to move. We still wanna execute the movement, hip flexion, we'll do it. It's, but over time it will, it can compress that labrum. And then you add any kind of other forces to it. Say you're playing bass, you know, any kind of lateral movement, up and down movement where you're moving the pelvis, you can shear it and that's where you get more of a tear and there's different types of tears, of course. So the first thing is, yes, please bend your knees. Always feel like you can bend your knees. Pay attention to what's happening at your pelvis, what's happening. And for you with the labrum, labral tear, really pay attention to that hip space. So you want space for the femur to be um, able to move in a variety of ways. Rotation, um, flexion is going to be a little bit trickier for anybody with a labral tear, usually. Um, so just bend your knees more. You're gonna need to bend your knees more because your hips are, might not flex as much as somebody like me. I can flex really back, get, get that femur gliding really well. And that already brings me three quarters of the way down to the floor. You need to bend your knees more to allow some of that, um, the smoothness of the femur being able to move back because if the knee is straight and kind of locking out the femur on that end and you don't have the glide on the other end that's when you're you're sharing on the labrum any other comments to that well yeah i mean i i agree with you 100 percent um i think that that's a very again kind of short-sighted view of I, if i had to guess the reason he's telling her that is her keeping her knee straight is locking out her hamstring so then her hamstring 
engages and doesn't let her tilt the pelvis as much. So therefore, she's not getting as much anterior tilt of the pelvis when she leans forward. And so she's not getting that shear at L4, L5. Well, why don't we look at why she's anteriorly tilted? If I had to guess a history of back pain and a labral tear, she's probably walking around an anterior pelvis all the time. It's not every time she bends over. That's not what's doing it. It's walking around in your life with an anteriorly pelvic, uh, tilted pelvis. So we have that pelvis go anterior. If you're watching on YouTube, you know, the sacrum's gonna go with it. Sacrum is L is a S1. So we've got these little blocks that sit on top, your vertebra, and if it's tilted forward, gravity is going to shear that lumbar spine forward and imp you know, impinge upon the back side of the spine. In the same token, you're tilted forward, it's gonna impinge on the, what you were talking about, on the front side of the pelvis, I mean, of the, of the hip. So if we can correct her pelvis in a neutral position, in all planes of motion, including that forward hinge, where if her pelvis is neutral, she'll be able to bend her knees and not have to use the hamstring to pull that pelvis backwards. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, I'm trying to yeah. get this, well, I'm using my right. hands. Like, on. exactly. It's, it's, I, I agree that usually there's a reason. And so, yeah. yeah, like if you don't bend your knees, you are, it's Pulling. harder to, um, but I still feel like the opposite is when you come up from a standing position and your knees are straight, those are the people who really tend to, tilts in the pelvis once they're straight up oh so sure it's like yeah so um but i agree with you that that he was he or she was probably trying to there was there was a reason we just don't exactly know it and it is a little reductionist because the knees again are not the issue right so the knees if anything can help you balance your pelvis when yeah. you balance your pelvis in neutral meaning the bowl is balanced you're more likely to balance the vertebral column coming up from the bowl. And then you're more likely to be able to move in your hips. But, you know, this is a full neuromotor remapping. When you have had an injury, what that injury is just telling you is what you were doing mechanically over and over with is, is not sustainable. So let's just change that. But that's going to take, you know, some, some work and some just remapping. And with those people, and I've worked with so many people with labral tears, yeah, really learning how to keep that space in the hip joint. Mm -hmm. um, and quite frankly, I don't know how you could really bend forward with your knees straight and not feel that in your in your labrum, um, unless you're just posturally tilting completely, and then you're going to feel it in your back. I don't know. Yeah, so, I was trying to figure out like yeah. why that you know why that advice was given. That's the only thing I could. Think of is oh well because your hamstring, you know, if she's tight in her hamstrings, but right. yeah. we actually use in our teaching the bend of the knees to facilitate neutralizing a pelvis that's really anteriorly tilted because, you know, that that allows you to come to neutral. So, yeah, my recommendation is let's look at that pelvis really closely in multiple ranges because we don't bend over that much. You know, I mean we do, but we want to get her neutral walking around, moving and being upright. So then when she, in opening up that back line of fascia, keeping that space at the front of the hip open. So then when she does bend over, she can bend her knees and not have to, she can keep that space available in the front side of the hip, which is also going to keep the space available in the back side of the, of the, of the lumbar spine. So yeah, it, it is, is yeah. it's interesting. So always feel free to Andrea um, or Andrea um, to, to just send us a little video of you um, hinging from the side and also standing. We'd love, we got to look at your starting posture. Yeah, and walking, yeah. Yes, yeah. so here we talked about mod modalities in our last podcast and we have another one. And this is from um, Kat in France, Paris. She wanted to know uh, our thoughts on dry needling. So I couldn't wait to, because you are certified in dry needling. And she was really interested in, in knowing more about it. And yeah, so why don't you go ahead and talk about dry needling? 
Sure. So dry needling is an interesting, um, r relatively newish modality for physical therapists anyway. And there's a big debate all over at least the United States. And there's a fight, there's a war going on between acupuncturists and physical therapists because acupuncture has been around for hundreds, thousands of years in, um, you know, more of a Eastern medicine. And where dry needling differs from acupuncture is dry needling is basically intramuscular stimulation. So when as a physical therapist, really there's PTs and orthopedic surgeons are at the top of the chain when it comes to anatomical knowledge. That's been shown. We know, we know more about the body than your primary care physician, than many doctors, with the exception of your orthopedic surgeon, who, my God, they're cutting into us. They better know, you know, especially what, what But then they doing. tend to know about one area really well. <laughs> yes. You know, PTs, we can specialize too. Yep. So we have this very delicate knowledge of the body. So we are using the same type of, so dry needle means there isn't a reservoir. A wet needle would be an injection where there's a reservoir in the center of the needle where you can inject serum, whatever, you know, your vaccines. A dry needle is a single filled filament. So we place the filament in a specific area of the body it might be a trigger point to get it to release it might be where um, just right in the muscle belly and a lot of times then we'll use some electricity think of it as restarting your computer so you know how your computer will glitch or it happened to me i was trying to get the link for our zoom today and it was like this web page is having trouble reloading i just have to shut it all down and restart it that's what we're doing with dry needling. We are doing an intramuscular stimulation because they, they, they have done studies that have shown muscles that are in spasm are in uh, or are dysfunctional. There is a, an, an imbalance in even the electrolytes, the pH of the muscle itself. And dry needling started when we used to send people who had trigger points, we'd send them off the pain doc to get a trigger point injection, which is basically they stick a needle into the trigger point. A lot of times it's just like a saline mixed with a, a, a painkiller, maybe an anti and oh my God, I feel better. Well, they started realizing it doesn't matter what they're putting in there. It was the needle. So you introduce this. It's disrupting the peripheral nerves communication to the brain and then back. And it's basically saying, calm the F down, right? It's just like giving it another, and that's what's so fascinating about the brain. It's like giving it something else to focus on. So it's not sending this message to the peripheral nerves, like stay in spasm. It's like, oh. And it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing when you stick a needle in a muscle that is dysfunctional and you put, you put a current to it that has a specific frequency. So I know I just slapped in a needle. I put a current to this needle. It should, that muscle should contract one beat per second. And when this muscle is, it's like, D -d 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 -d. it's so out of sync with the peripheral nervous system. It, it's like, and then all of a sudden, it starts to coordinate. Yep. So you're retraining and it's like, you can almost see the sigh of relief <laughs> in the body. I've had it done to myself many times where it's just like, ah, <sighs> It starts, we talked about this with the cramping, you know, it's not working well. And so it gets really missed. It's, it's, it's like a misfire. So we get that, that intramuscular stimulation to reboot the brain muscle connection. And it is a modality. Again, I can dry needle someone. And if I just send them on their merry way and they go back and do their shitty movement pattern and they start misusing the other accessory muscles, they're gonna come back and need more. So dry needling, great modality, works wonders for tension, headaches, low back pain, all those areas, the, the hips. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal modality, completely different from, from your acupuncturist. So don't say, don't assume your acupuncturist does dry needling, they might, but, and don't assume that you're getting acupuncture when you're going to a physical therapist but know that it's a great modality that should be followed up with some neuromuscular re-education by way of movement patterning, exercise, et cetera.
I love that. Yeah, I think this is again where we we don't want to be so short sighted um, that you know we just discount these different things that influence our nervous system at a level that we couldn't really tap into otherwise. It's awesome to have great movement. It's awesome to exercise. It's awesome to do all these things, but we have histories, we have nervous systems, we have trauma, we have blah, 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 that our brain is also, that's all up there. And so all this information coming in can get a little warped. And that's what is the, you know, they've shown this neuroscientists have shown this, that the brain can be like, it's like detangling some wires, like you said, that are faulty and, um, and you get like a little, like, it's almost like resuscitating. We're going to bring you back to life. So very cool. Well, thanks as always for these amazing questions. Uh, feel free to write us, direct message us on Instagram. That's the best way. Laura.Hyman or KB Williams 99. If you don't do Instagram, you can also write us at support at lit yoga, L I T yoga.com. And we can get those uh, questions there because we love hearing from you. There's always some really new, interesting stuff, and and we just love gabbing away about it. <laughs> All right, love you, sister. Love you too. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. We're pulling for you.